Hey guys, Clint Coons here, and I've been getting a number of comments on what it takes to become a real estate professional, so I decided, what the heck, let's cut a video on it. All right, so real estate professional status. This is that area that so many people that get started in real estate just want to apply for because they realize that if you become a real estate professional, you can meet that requirement, then the deductions that come from owning rental real estate, namely the depreciation, you can use those deductions, those losses, those paper losses against all other forms of income. Now, if you're unsure of what I'm referring to here, let me just give you a quick, quick example. So if I had real estate, some real estate, let's say I had two houses and after all the expenses associated with the properties, so we got taxes, insurance, it, repairs, and I write all that off, uh, for both these properties. And I have a number down here, let's say it's 10 K, but then I have what's called depreciation because all your property has to be depreciated. So I got to depreciate this on straight line depreciation, or maybe you're using cost seg with bonus depreciation, as I've talked about in some of my other videos, which is a, a tax technique you definitely want to look, consider. So let's just say I depreciate it. I have uh, $25,000 in depreciation I can write off this year. So for tax purposes, I show a loss of $15,000. Now, here's the deal. I want to use this loss. I just don't want it to sit there. I would like to take that loss, come over here and offset my $100,000 that we have on our 1040 because my wife and I are employed and we want to take this loss to reduce our 100K. So now we only have to pay taxes on $85,000, right? That would be so great that we could do that, take losses here through depreciation, use them against our W-2 income and not pay taxes on those losses. Well, unfortunately, code section 469 doesn't allow you to do this. See, these losses are called passive losses. And passive losses can only be used to offset other passive income. So if you had a, a, another interest in something, investment interest that produced income to you, you could use these losses to offset that income. But what you can't do is use these losses to offset your non-passive income, like the income you generate from your, your job, your W-2 income unless you can get yourself out of 469 through an exception uh, for these losses. And that is what we mean by real estate professional status. Real estate professionals are able to take these losses right here and apply them against all other forms of income. So the, the, the issue then becomes, how do I become a real estate professional? Well, section 469 makes it really simple for us they lay it all out. They say, if you want to use those losses to offset non-passive income, you have to do a couple things. Number one, you have to spend at least 750 hours a year on real estate related activities. Okay. So, so this is a lot of times a question for people. What is a real estate related activity? Well, uh, you know, if you're a, a agent or you're a broker, you're engaging in real estate related activities right there. If you're managing property, that's engaging in real estate related activities. So you have to be in a real estate field. You have to be actively involved in that and you have to spend 750 hours on that real estate activity. And again, it could be you're rehabbing your own properties every year. Granted, add up all those hours. So what's key here in being a real estate professional is you got to keep a log. Right. A lot of court cases turn on whether or not the individual who's claiming real estate professional status has maintained a log and whether or not that log was maintained contemporaneous with the hours. Right. So so when you're going to put together a log for your real estate hours to get that 750 hours, you want to be writing down the activity, the date and how much time you spent in your log. And that log should be taken. You should keep it accurate, up to date after you do the, the service. Now, one other thing, just as an aside, when you're doing your log, don't round up or don't round down. That is another mistake that I've seen people make is that they say, well, I worked an hour and a half, one hour, 1.25, 1.5, two hours. There's never one hour in 17 minutes or 42 minutes. This is something that can be scrutinized and they use that as a way in which to invalidate logs saying that they're not a true reflection of the time because 
No one spends an exact amount of time every time they're out on a job site or every time they're, they're working. It's not always rounded up or rounded down. So you got to keep accurate time uh, sheets for your hours. So that's the first thing. You got to spend 750 hours on this. Now, the second prong of this test is that you have to spend 50% of time, okay, on this up here. So you have to ensure that 50% of your time is devoted to real estate related activities. Now this can be confusing because I said 750 hours and you think, well, if I got 750 hours and that's all there was spent on real estate related activities, then that's 100% of my time on real estate related activities. That's not what we're looking at here. What we're looking at is what do you do throughout the year, all right? Do you have another job? Because if you're the other job that you have that is not in a real estate field, that is not considered to be a real estate related activity, then this is what that 50% is going to. So let's say that I was a fireman. So if I'm a fireman and I work full time as a fireman, even if it's only three days a week, then I am spending, according to the IRS, 100% of my time or more than 50% of my time on non real estate related activities. So even if I satisfy the 750 hours, I'm not a real estate professional. So the 50% of your time means this. If you hold a full time job in some non real estate related activity field, you're probably not going to qualify. And that's why we deal with a lot of physicians that you know want to get involved in real estate and they start buying properties and they want to take the deductions against their physician's income, but it doesn't work because they can't meet a real estate professional status because they work full time as a, uh, as a physician. So let's assume that you've done this. You're a real estate agent. You met this time, you met the 50% of your time. You got 750 hours. Great. You're there. Not quite. So the third aspect of this is you have to materially participate. Okay. In your activity, in your real estate related activity. Now, what is the material participation test? Well, there's seven enumerated tests or eight, I forget, uh, that you, you can qualify under for material participation. Now, the easiest one is this one. I'm only going to discuss it. You spend 100 hours on your real estate. So not only you have to be meet this test, be a real estate professional, but then you actually have to spend the time on your own real estate as well. So if I had, say, uh, four properties right here, just like this, right? I've got four properties. I'm a real estate agent, so I satisfy this because I'm always out there showing properties and things like this. I have my four properties here, but I don't do anything on those four properties because they're professionally managed out of state. I'm never dealing with them. Then I don't satisfy the material participation prong. And if these four properties are generating for me, say uh, this year, $60,000 in losses with, with depreciation with what I've done, I can't use this loss to offset my income that I'm making as a real estate agent because I can't satisfy the material participation test. And this is what causes problems for people in the rep status. They may satisfy this prong, but they always forget about this prong. So again, document your time. So the other aspect about this is that when you have real estate, if you want to be a real estate professional, you actually have to work on your properties as well. You just can't be in a real estate related field to pick up these deductions. And so that hundred hours is the easiest way to do it. Now, here's what happens. You know, when you have all these properties here, is it a hundred hours per property? No, the way you get around all this, if you meet prong one, two, and three, is then you wanna make sure that you're making an aggregation election to treat this as one unit on your tax return. So it's a, it's a statement that's sent in with your 1040 that you're making, you're saying, hey, I wanna treat this as one common activity, therefore, IRS, don't try to break these numbers up on each property. As long as I've spent the entire amount of time collectively on my real estate, then I'm good to go. Because I've seen plenty of cases where people failed to make the aggregation election, which isn't even part of the test. And by not making the aggregation election, they were denied the ability to use the deductions from their real estate to offset their non-passive income because then they start applying these tests on a per property basis. And you don't want to go there. The way you get around that is making that aggregation election. So real estate professional status, there's a lot of benefit that comes from being a real estate professional, but you have to be aware of the various tests that are laid out here. I often get this question. Well, Clint, can I become a real estate professional if I don't manage my own properties? 
it's going to be more difficult for you. If you're not self-managing, it's going to be difficult to meet the test because if you're out there just, you know, perform, you're managing the manager is really what it comes down to. The IRS basically looks at you as an investor then and you're just maintaining, uh, you're maintaining investor status and you're not actually involved in the day-to-day, -day, like, you know, bringing the unlawful detainers to evict people, screening the tenants who you're gonna bring in, going out and performing services on your properties when you get a tenant call or something like that. If all you're doing is taking an owner's statement that comes to you from your property manager and you're putting that into your QuickBooks and you're saying, well, I'm, I'm monitoring my, my QuickBooks on a monthly basis and I, and I spend uh, 15 or 20 hours a month doing that and therefore I, I should meet the test, it won't fly. So you actually have to be more involved in that. And so this is where we get into the weeds when it comes to being a real estate professional. Managing your properties, I think, is key. If you're not managing your properties, doing some of the rehab work on your properties count, uh, you should be doing that to get those hours. If you travel to look at property, if you don't buy the property, you can't count that time. But if you do purchase the property because you travel out of state, yes, you can count that time. So there's different ways you can massage it. The best thing to do, I would recommend, is set up a strategy session with someone in my firm. You can see I've got a link down below in the show notes to get a strategy session where we can analyze your individual situation to see if you qualify as a real estate professional because it's going to open up certain losses that you can use to help reduce your taxable income. And the last thing I'm going to leave you with, these types of losses are great if you're an investor who wants to borrow in the future because when you go in to apply for a loan, when you take depreciation as a loss on your, on your taxes, the lenders add all that back in to help you qualify for your debt to income ratios. Hey guys, if you liked the video, hit the like button. I hope this answered your questions on real estate professional status. And if you're not a subscriber, what the hell? Hit the subscribe button. Time to become one. All right, take care and all the best with your real estate investing.